I know that many of you are writers and photographers and painters. And I would like to talk a little bit about what we all have in common. And that is actually a wonderful burden that we share. Um, that burden is that if we don't give form to our state of mind, we suffer. We become grouchy. I turn into a biatch. <laughs> uh, we, we could become depressed or anxious. I mean, we really suffer if we don't make art. Um, we are artists, and being an artist is like having freckles or being black or trans or female. It's just something you can't shake off even if you wanted to. And artistic inspiration is non-judgmental. And beyond that, it's amoral. I don't mean immoral. I mean amoral in that it doesn't have, uh, it, it doesn't respond to social expectations. An artist may be inspired by a spectacular sunrise or an electron micrograph of the Ebola virus. Uh, it comes from adoring what we see. And so our art's greatness lies in its idiosyncratic capacity to open our eyes to enduring good regardless of its source. Without even trying to, artists of all types demonstrate and promote the ability to act from love. This is the value of artists to society. And here I am giving thanks to all of you artists and art lovers. So recently, I noticed something about the way I was making my collages. I've, now there are almost 150 collages in this how-to series. And what I noticed was that it, it has to do with the symbolic meaning of the locations of elements in the images. Um, I know this sounds a bit obscure, but, but wait. The, the picture plane, as you doubtless know, is um, the term used to describe the imaginary surface of a two-dimensional artwork. I would say that it's the actual surface, but that would bring in notions of texture which have nothing to do with the picture plane. The picture plane just gives us a context for the discussion of the organization of visual elements. The format, on the other hand, is what we call the outer shape of the picture. Now what I noticed about my collages was that I was pretty consistently using the different parts of the picture plane to mean certain things. Maybe all people who were raised to read from left to right have similar associations. In any case, for me, to put it very simply, emphasis on the upper right is hope. The bottom right is endings and departures. The center is the self. The upper left is innocence, memory, and beginnings, and the bottom left is the foundation. I was a bit shocked to notice this system underlying my compositions. And although it doesn't work to ignore the elements of the picture and try to understand the, um, the collage on these compositional guidelines alone, it's interesting to keep them in mind. So upper right is hope. Lower right, what did I say, is endings and departures. Upper left is memory and beginnings and innocence. Lower left is foundations and the center is the self. And I mentioned reading from left to right because, of course, reading a page, um, as we do, introduces the notion f to us from an early age that the beginning is at the upper left and the ending is at the bottom right. Normally, when Western artists talk about composition, they say that the objective of pictorial design is to organize visual elements in such a way that the viewer will be enticed to look at every part of the picture plane. Now, I am all for pictures that are worth looking at thoroughly. What is supposed to happen is that the viewer's eye will be drawn from one area of interest or contrast to another until the whole message of the picture has been conveyed. There are so-called rules of composition, and I'm going to present them to you with the puritanical nicknames that I've given them. <laughs> they are no sitting, 
no kissing or touching, <laughs> no hugging, no squashing, no slipping out the corner, and no hogging the middle. <laughs> These are the rules of design intended to prevent the viewer's eye from getting hung up in one place for the wrong reasons. No sitting means that objects should not sit on the bottom edge of the format. No kissing means the edge of an object should not be just barely touching the edge of the format. If it does, the viewer won't be able to look at anything else. No hugging means that the side of an object should not parallel the side of the picture plane in, an, uh, in a way that awkwardly traps a rectangular space there. No squashing means that a recognizable object, say a face, should not be distorted to force it to fit inside the picture's format. No slipping out the corner means that a strong diagonal should not lead the viewer's eye out the corner of the format. And no hogging the middle means that a point of interest there will dominate the composition. The format is simply the shape of the artwork but its hidden grid of power is anything but simple. I could go on ad nauseam about the force fields exerted by the center points and corners and the ways in which focal points of contrast gravitate toward those magnets and get stuck. Things get really hairy when more and more visual elements are introduced and they're all exerting forces on each other by echoing each other's colors and patterns, placements, shapes, and angles. Chaos can result. The goal is to keep the viewer's eye moving throughout the picture plane, but chaos is too much movement, unless you want to make a picture about chaos. A painter who loves a square format as much as I do once explained the challenge by saying, it's all corners. <laughs> In other words, it's full of potential tension, and you have to be on your toes to harness that tension. Adding or deleting even a small mark can disrupt the delicate balance that keeps the eye engaged. Too balanced or too chaotic, and the viewer turns away. The placement of the shapes you see here was arrived at by um, stubborn trial and error, and at times by lucky accident. One way a fortunate thing happens is when a shape is placed where it is so manifestly breaking the rules that its very existence in that place makes a statement. In other words, precisely because it is blatantly kissing, sitting, squashing, or hogging, it is making meaning. And I'd like to direct your attention to that big collage there. This is called How to Stand Up. And here you can see, I'm sorry that you have to get up and see, but this relatively small X here, right here, that X, um, implies a whole plane of movement. You see how its feet are standing on this plane of movement going this way, whereas all the rest of the movement in the picture is going that way. So that X is implying a plane of movement that is perpendicular to the rest of the movement in the picture. <coughs> the only way that X can do that is because it's holding the center, it's hogging the center, it's got the power of the center. So sometimes what a dynamic composition needs is an anchor to create some meaning and balance. I, I hope you will all agree that as soon as a viewer enters an illusionistic space of a picture, the artwork becomes a site of narrative. The viewer's imagination launches the artwork's drama. In a collage of mine, the viewer visits an imaginary landscape that is usually also populated by active abstract participants. Most of you already know that I construct my collages out of pieces of my monotype prints my process begins in the printmaking studio where I experiment with mark making to discover novel combinations of colors, patterns, and textures. I don't seek to make finished works in the printmaking studio, only to make the raw material for my collages. The prints travel to my other studio in Davidson, which is devoted to collage, and there the work is meaning making. 
Part of the motive of my process is deliberate destructiveness. As I tear in half a favorite print, I am testing the theory that killing one's darlings opens doors to expression. Ah, see, the writer's going, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> My imaginary, well, ab uh, my imagery, while well, abstract, is landscape-based and tied to the idea that impermanence is the only reality. The colors of changing light and shadows, the forms of rocks, roots, and water, and the movement of leaves and clouds inspire my experiments and provide me with my symbols. Although I don't intend expressly for my work to have political content, I wonder whether I can actually avoid it. I speak through nature's patterns and process human activity through an act of environmental awareness couched in beauty. I don't have a moral agenda in my studio, but I wonder whether my collages might be very much part of this uneasy moment in North American history. After all, there are collages titled How to Face Down a Bully, How to Stand Up. <laughs> And there are collages about the end of a drought, the repression of fears. Oh, this one is called, where is it? Oh, I don't see it here. How to repress is in the other room. Um, and, uh, and the time to make the most of one's blessings. Of course, my personal life pervades my imagery, but I don't mean for you to think about that as it is only the lens through which an artist focuses on her subject matter.